Good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to MSK Science Spotlight. My name is Thomas Tamela. I'm an, I'm, I'm an assistant member in uh, the Cancer Biology and Genetics Program at Sloan Kettering Institute. This online seminar series will feature live streamed lectures from today's leaders in basic and translational biomedical science. We will have a seminar on Mondays and Wednesdays at, at 4.30 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time. Uh, and we really wish many of you can join us and, and spread the word. If you have questions throughout the talk, you can email them to the Office of Scientific Education and Training at oset at mskcc.org. That is O-S-E-T at mskcc.org or use the Twitter handle at MSK Education. And these are also shown here on the slide for your reference. Uh, Mike will then take questions at the uh, end of the program and we'll try to answer as many questions as we have time for. I'm really excited and thrilled to present the first speaker of our seminar series, physician scientist, Mike Lickman. Mike is a member of the immunology program at the Sloan Kettering Institute. He's an attending physician in infectious diseases at, at the Memorial Hospital. And he's also the Alfred P. Sloan Chair and Director for the Center of Experimental Immuno-Oncology at MSKCC. Mike's talk today is, the, is titled The Intersection of Cancer and Infection in the Time of COVID. Please, Mike. Okay, Thomas, thank you very much. I hope everybody can hear me okay out there. I have no idea how many of you are out there, but welcome to the uh, first inaugural lecture of the MSK Science Spotlight series. I'd like to first uh, show uh, financial disclosures. So here they are, they're unrelated to the topic of the talk, but you can see them here. Okay, so what I would like to do today is to talk about uh, the work in my laboratory uh, um, and try to link it to the present uh, pandemic crisis that we're all uh, so aware of. I thought it would be appropriate at the beginning to talk a little bit about uh, what, indeed the very reason that we're having this seminar series, and that is we all have been affected by the COVID crisis. And I thought it would be appropriate to start with this uh, incredibly powerful cover from today's New Yorker, in which we see a uh, busy hospital with people in full PPE, wheeling around patients, uh, presumably with COVID infection, and a healthcare worker uh, uh, video chatting with their people at home. So I think uh, what I'd like to emphasize with this is that the crisis that we're uh, encountering now and all dealing with is happening in real time. It's a real time healthcare crisis and our colleagues in the hospital, uh, um, of which uh, I am one as well, uh, have real life patients who are um, need attention now. The purpose of this seminar series is to highlight science. Uh, and I think for all biomedical scientists and particularly physician scientists, uh, we understand that we have an ob obligation to treat patients in the best way we, we can in the present moment, but also an obligation to seek uh, better treatments and better therapies through the long-term time horizon of biomedical research. And it is that uh, longer-term horizon that we hope to highlight through these series, and I will highlight it uh, for you today. Uh, but we, of course, never want to forget about um, the real, real-time real uh, uh, medical emergencies with which we're faced. I also thought it would be appropriate, uh, even though I am not a virologist, I'm a microbiologist and mycobacteriologist, as you will see, uh, I thought it would be worthwhile talking just about a couple of uh, scientific tidbits related to the present uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so I'm showing you here a uh, map of the positive strand RNA genome of the uh, SARS coronavirus 2, the disease known as COVID-19. And I wanted by this slide both to orient you to some of the basic molecular biology of this virus and also to highlight some of the intersections of this uh, virus with some of the research efforts going on here at MSKCC. So it's about uh, 30 KB positive strand RNA virus. Uh, it as many all viruses do, encodes multiple overlapping open reading frames, protein coding open reading frames. 
some of the most prominent viral uh, proteins are pictured here and uh, uh, reflecting the incredible pace that scientific uh, research has taken towards this virus. Some of the structures of these proteins have already been solved and those structures are shown here. Um, so this is the trimeric spike protein that is on the top in the outside of the COVID-19 virus. Uh, this is the uh, viral protein that interacts with the cellular receptor on the host, which is the angiotensin converting enzyme 2. Uh, in particular, through this receptor binding domain, which is a, uh, a small region of the spike protein here. Uh, and it, this is important because it mediates viral entry into the host cell and also importantly is the subject of the host antibody response. And in two of these papers pictured here uh, or citations given here on MedArchive, you can read about early efforts to develop serologic tests that detect antibodies against either this isolated receptor binding domain or the full length trimeric spike protein and in some cases as well against this N protein, the nucleocapsid protein. These serologic tests will, of course, you've probably read about them and they will be important in determining uh, uh, who has developed antibodies and who has been exposed to the virus. Uh, and we expect that they will be rolled out by a variety of commercial vendors. Uh, but here at MSK, we, are, uh, we want to guarantee that we have access to these serologic tests and so I am involved in a group here that is purifying uh, these three proteins, the receptor binding domain, uh, the uh, trimeric spike protein, and the N protein in collaboration with our structural biology program. And we will attempt to replicate the work of Florian Kramer and others at Mount Sinai who were generous enough to share their, their plasmids with us in order to guarantee that we have a serologic test available for both our employees and our patients. Uh, so these 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 uh, efforts are ongoing. Um, I also wanted to highlight uh, a unexpected connection between research done here at Sloan Kettering Institute and the viral life cycle that is pictured on the so right side of this slide. Um, and so, as I said, this is an, a negative strand. I'm sorry, positive strand RNA virus that, when it's unpacked and enters the cell, is immediately translated by the host translation machinery. Um, and it is the case that the five prime end of the viral RNA contains uh, complicated uh, RNA structures that require uh, host initiation factors in order to unwind those RNA structures. It turns out that uh, Hans Guido Wendel, one of the members in our um, cancer biology program has worked on these factors because they are also involved in translating uh, oncogenic RNAs in the cancer cell and has indeed pursued these targets through small molecule therapeutic development. Uh, he realized uh, a long time ago now in, in collaboration with his collaborator, Arnold Grunweller at the University of Marburg, that these, these small molecules might also be active on viral infections because they, these viruses require these factors to translate their RNAs. Uh, and indeed he has shown in this, uh, in this paper here uh, with, um, with his collaborators that they indeed have antiviral activity, including against other coronaviruses. So. Guido is, is pursuing this line of investigation um, to re repurpose some of these compounds as t candidate uh, antiviral agents. Um, and so I, I think this is uh, sort of brings up one of the themes that I'd like to emphasize today, and that is there are these unexpected connections between uh, infectious agents and the cancer cell that, and that our ability to investigate both in conjunction uh, has great power to have us understand one or the other. And I'm gonna spend some time going into some of the examples that have uh, uh, been at MSK over the years that have allowed um, investigations into infectious biology and cancer bi biology to synergize in ways that were indeed quite unexpected. Um, so here I put up some, uh, some very famous papers from MSK over many, many years, uh, and these, emphasize the uh, origins of um, the interaction between infectious agents and tumor cells. So on the left here is a paper by William Coley published in 1893. Uh, this, uh, is, uh, these, the, this is often referred to as Coley's toxin. And this was a, he was an oncologist here at um, uh, um, MSK. 
And this, the observation here was that malignant tumors, in particular sarcomas, in, in some cases regressed in the setting of bacterial infection, in this case, erysipelas, which is a group A strep infection. This was then uh, advanced into a sort of uh, a bacterial cocktail of microbial products that uh, we now would say, although it was not understood at the time, would now would say are activators of the innate immune system. And it led to this idea that microbial products are in some ways uh, anti-tumor or can induce an anti-tumor-like effect in the host. This led uh, many years later to our, uh, our late colleague Lloyd Old and his collaborators here at Memorial Sloan Kettering to uh, look at the serum of a, of a mouse that was infected by BCG. Now, I'm going to talk a lot more about BCG later in the talk. Um, it is an uh, acronym for an attenuated strain of Mycobacterium bovis. Uh, and what Lloyd and his colleagues showed was that there was an uh, endotoxin and BCG-induced serum factor that caused necrosis of tumors, and that this was a transferable activity. This was the cytokine we now know as tumor necrosis factor alpha. And again, advanced this idea that microbial infection can have immune effects that are anti-tumor and that might be harnessed for anti-tumor activity. And then finally, uh, this paper from my friend Carl Nathan, uh, in which they administered the newly discovered cytokine uh, interferon gamma to cancer patients here at MSK and show that the, that that in vivo administration of interferon gamma enhanced mon monocyte activation uh, here measured by the oxidative burst. And so this history in really informs uh, certainly the work in my lab and the work uh, of many investigators here because it, it reflects a, uh, a viewpoint that is pictured on this slide. So this is a very colorful comparison between what we, the way we conceive of infectious biology and tumor biology. So uh, on the right is an infectious lesion, and in it I've pictured uh, several different infectious agents. So you can see here there's an intracellular bacterium here inside of a macrophage. I hope you can see this red uh, fake laser pointer I'm using here. Um, this might be mycobacterium tuberculosis, this might be salmonella, this might be uh, BCG. Uh, and the elimination of this intracellular bacteria requires a, uh, a symphony of innate and adaptive immune cells that ultimately eliminate the pathogen or fail to eliminate the pathogen by uh, deploying a set of immune effector molecules. Same for virally infected cells that I've pictured here. So for example, coronavirus, other virally infected cells require a suite of immune cells all working in concert, and the dysfunction of those immune cells may lead to failure of infectious control. Um, in the infectious world, we call that dissemination, uh, but it has a great parallel in the immune milieu of the tumors of the tumor. The tumor can be seen, we think, as a, uh, and by many others, of course, as a complicated uh, developmental set of interacting cells that include immune cells, stromal cells, and the cancer cell. The effective control of this tumor cell, which in our minds would be equivalent to the pathogen, uh, requires uh, all of these cells to cooperate to ultimately eliminate the cancer cell. And the failure of that process, either because of an immune cell dysfunction or other factors, leads to escape from the primary lesion and metastasis. And so we, we think that studying the interacting and parallel universes of infectious lesions and tumor lesions uh, has great power to potentially inform uh, tumor biology and infectious biology. And I'm gonna tell you a story uh, for the rest of the talk about, about how we have done that or tried to do that in my lab using the paradigm of BCG in, it, in its use as a therapy of bladder cancer. Before I do that, I'd like to just come back to the COVID-19 crisis because many of you who are reading the news may have noticed that there, was a, uh, there has been a flurry of news stories that um, have proposed or highlighted efforts to use this same uh, organism, BCG, to, uh, as a vaccine against COVID-19 or the coronavirus. So here is a, uh, a, a 
a story that was in the New York Times yesterday uh, that talks about BCG being used as a uh, as a therapy for COVID-19 or a preventative. These are many other stories, including from the Irish Times. There are many of them now. And indeed, there are two clinical trials already listed on clinicaltrials.gov that uh, seek to use BCG vaccination to protect healthcare workers against COVID-19 exposure. Um, and so those of you out there who are immunologists or maybe even those out there who are uh, not immunologists might think to yourselves, why does this make sense? What, why would we, we, we be using a bacterial vaccine against a viral infection? It seems to fly in the face of, of all traditional concepts of immunology in which we think of vaccines as being uh, weakened or subunit forms of the infection trying to be prevented. Uh, and that is because we think of the immune system as conferring antigenic specificity in its response. And therefore, uh, we want to immunize with antigens that are similar to the, the, those of the infecting agent. But in this case, there is uh, essentially no chance that that is the case. BCG is a mycobacterium. It has no homology to the viral proteins I showed you earlier in the talk on, on COVID or any other virus, most likely. Uh, and so why, why, what is the rationale for doing this? And I'm going to try to convince you in the rest of the talk that the rat, we can learn about the rationale for doing something like this by studying BCG's effect on uh, cancer cells and the elimination of tumors via BCG. Okay, so just a little background on BCG. I, I don't know how familiar people are, probably they might be more familiar than they were a week ago because of the news stories, but I'm just gonna review so we're all on the same page here. So um, BCG is the world's most widely administered vaccine. Uh, it was derived by prolonged in vitro passage of virulent Mycobacterium bovis, which as is the case for all bacterial and, and viral pathogens, when passaged in vitro, they undergo spontaneous attenuation. And in the case of Mycobacterium bovis, which is, was isolated from a cow udder, because uh, it it's a bovine pathogen, uh, it uh, underwent multiple chromosomal deletions that we now understand on the, from whole genome uh, bacterial DNA sequencing. And that produced an attenuated strain that was then used worldwide as a vaccine, first against my Mycobacterium bovis and then against Mycobacterium tuberculosis, the infection that I study in my lab and which is a worldwide uh, longstanding uh, inf pandemic and, and causes um, uh, severe suffering throughout the world. Um, and so it is still given in most of the world to most infants at birth. It is not given in the United States uh, and most of Western Europe. Um, but its use as a vaccine against TB is really follows established principles that I talked about of live attenuated vaccines. It is an antigenic mimic of the infection it is trying to prevent. However, there is significant epi epidemiologic data that in indicates that in addition to its potential protective effect against TB, it also has a second effect, and that is it conferring heterologous protection, if you will, against other infections, including respiratory viruses. I put the PubMed IDs of some of those epidemiologic studies here. Uh, but the, the, the basic observation is that there is a uh, immune or, or some effect of BCG that confers protection against viral infections, including respiratory viral infections such as RSV, and that, uh, as I said before, this cannot be an antigenically specific phenomenon. There is also experimental evidence that BCG administration to humans can modify the time course and severity of a viral infection. So that's, that's in this paper here. In this paper, what they did is they administered BCG to humans and then gave them the yellow fever vaccine, which is a live attenuated viral vaccine. And they measured the kinetics of viral replication of that vaccine, and they measured the immune response to that vaccine. And I'm just gonna show you one uh, figure from that paper uh, in which they profiled, in which they profiled the uh, monocytes of the people vaccinated with BCG. So on the left here, you, you see, uh, K27, H3K27 acetylation at promoters in monocytes of people before immunization with BCG on the left. 
or one month after vaccination with BCG on the right. And this is just meant to show that there is a global epigenetic rewiring of the mononuclear cells in these people's blood in response to this vaccine. And the uh, efficacy of BCG in attenuating this yellow fever vaccine viral infection was linked to the production of IL-1 beta in, in these immune cells. So uh, it provides a direct human example of BCG modifying an infection in which it is, uh, it is antigenically distinct. And so we, we, one might refer to this as heterologous protection. Okay. So um, I want to then shift gears and talk about how we've tried to understand BCG's use as a cancer therapy, because I think it, it follows the same paradigm. It, it's an example of BCG being used as a, a heterologous agent to induce immunity to a, 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 a entity to which it is unrelated. And so just to introduce you to uh, the um, clinical use of BCG, this may be familiar to one of many of the people in the audience, but just to review. So BCG is the only FDA approved uh, therapy, bacterial therapy of cancer. It is the same organism that is used as the uh, vaccine for tuberculosis. And it is used in the following way. So when our urology colleagues detect an early stage bladder lesion, either uh, uh, carcinoma in situ, T1 or TA bladder cancers. They are resected cystoscopically, and then BCG is given in the following schedule. So after transurethral resection, uh, after the patient recovers, BC is, is given as a live bacterial therapy in the bladder of these patients every week for six weeks. Uh, in some cases, it is given as a maintenance therapy as well following this initial course. And it was shown in, cl in rigorous clinical trials, some done here at MSK, that it uh, is, decreases recurrence of, of carcinoma in situ after resection. It is superior to giving intravesical or intrabladder chemotherapy. But it's not perfect. It has a 30% uh, failure rate. Uh, um, it's, uh, we have no way of predicting individual response to the treatment, so we give it to everybody and, and then monitor for recurrence. And then there are uh, some cases, rare cases of, uh, of whether because it's a live bacterium, it does, uh, it can escape the bladder and cause disseminated infection, a problem that we see uh, when it happens on the infectious diseases service at MSK. And so what is the basis for uh, BCG's anti-tumor activity? This is obviously a longstanding question and uh, it, People have been studying it for some time, but I, I'm going to argue to you that we still do not really understand the immunologic basis for BCG's anti-tumor activity. And I'm going to lay out a set of uh, hypotheses that we're then going to test uh, using uh, mouse models in my laboratory. Okay, so if we ask the question, what is the antigenic basis for BCG-induced tumor elimination? We think of this in two maybe oversimplistic, but useful uh, ways. So the first is that the, and this has been uh, debated in the field for many years, the first is that the relevant immune response that eliminates the tumor is a mycobacterial specific immune response, that uh, when you give BCD in the bladder, you generate a mycobacterial specific immune response. This generates uh, BCG specific T cells that migrate to the bladder mucosa, and they destroy the infected tumor cells either because of antigenic cross-reactivity, because there's some BCG antigen which is similar to a tumor antigen in the cell, or that the tumor cells are actually infected. In fact, uh, my lab, and, and uh, in collaboration with Gil Ruttleman City, has shown that indeed bladder cancer cells are infected by BCG. Uh, so it could be that the tumor cells are killed because they're an infected cell and the immune system recognized that, and the relevant immune response uh, that eliminates that bladder cancer is BCG specific. Uh, so this would predict that augmentation of BCG, BCG specific immunity would improve the efficacy of the treatment for cancer. But one would also predict that if this were the only mechanism at play, that there would be no long-term immunity to tumor specific antigens. And uh, I point you to this important paper in the literature that, that strongly argued for this model because uh, I'm not going to go into all the data, but there was there was evidence in this paper that B 
BCG-specific T cells are primed, and that indeed pre-immunization with BCG before treating mice for bladder cancer was able to enhance the efficacy of BCG, and this is actually being tested in a clinical trial now. But there's an alternate idea, uh, and that alternate idea is that um, in contrast to this, what I might call the mycobacterial antigen-specific mechanism, that BCG is actually, act, actually acting to induce a tumor-specific immune response and that the ultimate immune response that eliminates the tumor is what we is more on along the lines of what we think about in in uh, newer forms of immunotherapy. So this in this uh, uh, schematic, um, BCG would be inducing uh, a nonspecific change in the tumor inflammatory uh, environment. This would somehow prime tumor specific T cells that are the ultimate effector cell that eliminates the tumor. And this leads to antigen-specific immune destruction. In this schema, augmentation of BCG-specific immune responses would not improve efficacy, but there would be long-term immunity to tumor antigens. And so I'm gonna take you through a series of experiments from my lab that are uh, been going on for many years, but have recently come to fruition, that seeks to distinguish between these two models, the mycobacterial antigen-specific model that I might consider might be analogous to the use of BCG as a, as a vaccine for TB, and the heterologous model in which BCG is used to immunize against a heterologous antigen, whether in this case be a tumor or in the cases I cited before, a viral infection. Okay, so we use a mouse model of bladder cancer in order to examine uh, these questions. It's asked these mechanistic questions. This is the MB49 model of, of uh, bladder cancer. It is a BCG responsive model. It is quite laborious, uh, but Gil, uh, Redelman City, Anthony Antonelli, and Anna Benjamin, who I'll show you pictures of at the end, have mastered this model and they can implant uh, MB49 cells. So this is a syngeneic bladder cancer model in which you implant uh, these tumor cells into the bladder. And in this picture, they're, they're expressing luciferase. You can see that all mice have the tumors. Uh, and then if you then, uh, every week for six weeks in the same schedule that the humans are treated with, treat these mice with BCG in the bladder, uh, according to this schedule here. So you get, they get MB49 cells and then they get BCG in the bladder. Uh, you have a BCG dependent uh, uh, survival phenotype uh, untreated mice all universally die. BCG-treated mice survive around 50%, uh, and this is a relatively reproducible phenotype, and it provides a, a model to dissect the immunologic mechanism of this BCG-induced anti-tumor response. Okay, so the first experiment we did, and, and uh, again, um, these experiments uh, are unpublished, but are, uh, are sort of under review right now. And uh, the, first, the, first experiment we, the first experiment we did was to ask a very simple question, does the BCG anti-tumor response require host T cells? Um, this, has, this had been done many years ago in the literature, but uh, we wanted to repeat it. And indeed, we, we replicated the published findings. So if you implant MB49 in the bladder of mice, and then you treat them with BCG while giving either nothing or CD4 or CD8 depleting antibodies. You can see that those depleting antibodies deplete uh, T cells quite efficiently. The CD4 depleted mice have no CD4 cells. The CD8 depleted mice have no CD8 cells. And if you look at the survival curve of that experiment, you see that BCG leads to the predicted survival. Untreated mice in blue uh, have the expected mortality. And indeed, CD4 or CD8 depleted mice are unable to respond to BCG as an immunotherapy. So broadly speaking, uh, the, the therapy does require host T cells in the, in the broadest possible way. Um, we then went on to do a, a little more involved experiment, but still a relatively straightforward experiment. And that was, we wanted to ask whether um, BCG alone was sufficient to confer immunity to the tumor or whether BCG treatment of the tumor was required to have anti-tumor immunity. And so here's the experimental schema here. We have three groups of mice, mice that are in the uh, standard MB49 model. 
they get intravesical uh, MB49 and then uh, uh, treatments with BCG. We then had a control group in which the mice received BCG only in the bladder, but had never seen the tumor cell because this is an implantable model. Uh, one can omit that. And so these, these mice will have BCG immunity only, uh, but, but have never seen the tumor antigen present in the tumor. And then we had a set of untreated mice. We then rechallenged those mice subcutaneously with the same MB49 tumor to ask whether tumor immunity was conferred only when this combination is given or whether BCG alone is sufficient. So I'll just call your attention to this experiment here. This is the tumor volume uh, um, after subcutaneous implantation. You can see that untreated mice are unable to reject the tumor here. BCG treated mice are also unable to reject the tumor. This is not statistically significant, but they are no different than untreated mice in their ability to control MB49. However, mice that are cured of MB49 by BCG are completely resistant to tumor implantation, suggesting long-term tumor immunity. And this was tumor specific. So if you implanted a un antigenically unrelated tumor, the B16 melanoma cell line, all three groups of mice were equivalently susceptible and unable to reject these subcutaneous tumors. So we thought this provided uh, strong evidence that number one, BCG is able to induce anti-tumor immunity. Number two, BCG alone is insufficient to confer that anti-tumor immunity, which would seem to go against the idea that BCG-specific immunity is the effector mechanism that eliminates these tumors. And then finally, uh, we did a the following experiment. We did the same uh, sets of mice, but then instead of challenging the mice subcutaneously, we then transferred T cells from these mice into new naive mice and then challenged them in the bladder with MB49 cells. And you can see here that mice who received T cells from mice that had been previously cured of MB49 by BCG were able to reject the tumor without further BCG treatment but BCG T cells, T cells from a mouse that have received only BCG had no effect. And so again, evidence that the end result of BCG therapy uh, is tumor specific immunity, which is T cell transferable. And that BCG specific immunity is certainly not sufficient to recapitulate this anti-tumor effect. We wanted to do this a different way. So we did a, uh, Gil did a second, second set of experiments where we tried to augment the BCG specific immune response to see if this would enhance the efficacy of BCG. And so here um, we're doing uh, experiments where we're actually transferring a uh, TCR transgenic T cell line that is specific for BCG. So this is P25. It's a T cell, a transgenic uh, T cell uh, mouse that encodes a T cell receptor specific to the antigen 85 protein of BCG. We transferred these cells into MB49 bearing mice and treated them with BCG or PBS. You can see we got robust activation of the P25 uh, population, not surprisingly, because we're giving them a BCG infection in the bladder. These uh, P25 cells were activated by BCG, also not surprisingly. Uh, but despite uh, a greatly enhanced BCG specific T cell response, uh, P25 had no additional benefit uh, to it did not enhance the efficacy of BCG for eliminating the tumor. This green line is just a control uh, TCR transgenic line that doesn't, doesn't recognize a BCG antigen. So we were unable to enhance the efficacy of BCG by, by enhancing BCG specific immunity, which coupled with the prior experiment uh, made us uh, um, uh, doubtful that BCG immunity was the primary uh, mediator of this effect. We then uh, went on to um, uh, ask about the immunologic requirements for the long-term tumor, tumor immunity induced by BCG. So uh, I, I showed you experiments in, before that said that um, uh, BCG uh, in the acute phase for elimination of the tumor required both CD4 and CD8 T cells. And we did the same experiment essentially in the e re-challenge model in which, in which we're challenging mice that have been cured of MB49. 
uh, and then can, you know, under, in wild type conditions, reject subcutaneous challenge with the same tumor cell. And then we depleted CD4 or 8, CD8 cells in the same way. And so these are tumor volumes over time in uh, four groups of mice. So you can see naive mice uh, are unable to reject uh, MB49. They have uncontrolled tumor growth. Uh, mice that are uh, survivors of MB49 BCG treatment are able to reject the tumors shown here. Quite surprisingly, despite the codependence in the acute phase for CD4 and CD8 T cells, in the in the memory phase, really CD4 T cells were the dominant actor here. You can see this green line is CD4 depletion. They are almost uh, as susceptible to subcutaneous challenge as uh, naive mice. And although there was a small phenotype of CD8 depletion, it was much more, less impressive than CD4 cells. So, and th these these graphs show essentially the same thing. You can see that. Um, all mice that were uh, depleted of CD4 cells had recurrent tumor. CD8 cells had detectable tumors, but they were much, much smaller uh, than, than CD4 depleted animals. So this, this suggested to us that, that the anti-tumor immunity induced by BCG in the bladder cancer model is predominantly CD4 dependent. Uh, and we wanted to have a way of looking at uh, neoantigen specific T cells, because this, this suggested to us that there was a neoantigen specific T cell response. And we wanted to try to interrogate the phenotypic effects of BCG on tumor specific T cells. Um, I'll say we looked very hard for neoantigens encoded in the, BC, in the MB49 genome, and we were unsuccessful in identifying those. Uh, so we went to a, a model system in which we expressed a model antigen uh, in MB49. So those experiments are shown here. So what we did here is we expressed, uh, as many people have done, uh, the uh, epitopes for uh, MHC class two and MHC class one restricted OVA peptides in the MB49 cell, and then used uh, OT1 and OT2 uh, T cell transfer to interrogate the phenotype of tumor specific T cells both CD8 and CD4, OVA-specific, but in this case, tumor-specific T cells, and what the effect of BCG would be. Um, we sort of hypothesized multiple different possibilities here. I mean, I thought the most likely thing would be that BCG would enhance the recruitment of tumor-specific T cells to the tumor uh, or enhance their function in some way. And uh, we found one of those and not the other. So this is just a enumeration of the intratumoral CD4 and CD8 T cells. So CD8 on the top, CD4 on the bottom. You can see that BCG treated tumors do not have an enhanced number of tumor specific T cells. In fact, they have in some ways, uh, either according to absolute numbers or relative numbers of CD4 cells have fewer, uh, reflecting the likely the BCG specific uh, T cell influx. Um, so there was not a, 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 a clear effect of enhancement, at least, of BCG on the numbers of tumor-specific T cells in the bladder. However, when we looked at T cell function down here on the left, so on the top are OT1s or CD tumor-specific CD8s, and the bottom are OT2s, which are tumor-specific CD4s, when we re-stimulated these cells, we could see that BCG greatly enhanced the cytokine production of these tumor-specific T cells. Here is shown interferon gamma. This was mostly limited to the CD4 compartments. So CD8 tumor-specific T cells did not really have enhanced function with, with BCG, but CD4 cells did, consistent with the data I showed you before, saying that this was a CD4-dependent uh, tumor immunity. We also detected a decline uh, consistent with this enhanced infector, effector function of uh, PD-1 expression on tumor-specific CD4 cells in this model. So this was consistent with the idea that BCG is not uh, stimulating tumor-specific CD4 uh, proliferation, but it is enhancing the effector function of T cells that migrate to the bladder. And then I have one more data slide, which I'll show you, and then I'll just sum up. Uh, we wanted to try to interrogate the uh, targets of interferon gamma that are being produced by these tumor-specific T cells. It was reported many years ago that interferon gamma is required for BCG response in the bladder cancer model. Uh, and uh, we wanted to ask whether that the target of that interferon gamma uh, is either on the tumor cell itself or on bystander immune cells in the tumor microenvironment. 
and uh, Anthony Antonelli did these experiments. So this is uh, what we did here is we first assayed the expression of the interferon gamma receptor on the MB49 cell line. Indeed, they do express interferon gamma receptor. In uh, data I'm not showing you here, they are. this is a functional receptor. If you stimulate them with interferon gamma, they do express, uh, for example, MHC class II. Uh, we then uh, used CRISPR-mediated genome editing to delete the interferon gamma receptor uh, from these cells, so that's shown here. And you can see they're no longer interferon gamma receptor positive, uh, either at baseline or when stimulated by interferon gamma itself, and they lose any downstream signaling of interferon gamma. We then tested these interferon gamma receptor knockout cells in the BCG model, and you can see here the expected survival of BCG-treated wild-type MB49 cells. Here is the survival of, uh, of untreated MB49, and you can see that expression of the interferon gamma receptor on these tumor cells is required for BCG response. And in fact, you'll notice that these are, are more aggressive even than the uh, control here, suggesting that there's some level of, of surveillance going on even in the absence of BCG that's mediated through the tumor cell interferon gamma receptor, consistent with data from many other groups about the importance of, of tumor cell interferon gamma receptor. Uh, we then did the same experiment in the rechallenge model, and you can see here that uh, interferon gamma receptor is required as well in the memory phase. So in the same phase where I told you that CD4 T cells were required and BCG enhances their effector functions by production of interferon gamma, uh, indeed you need to express the interferon gamma receptor on the tumor cell in order for the uh, host to maintain tumor suppression, uh, shown here and here. Okay, so I wanna finish up so we have time for uh, questions. So I just wanted to show you the model uh, that we're working on now and uh, give you some perspective. Uh, so we think that uh, the mechanism of action of BCG in its anti-tumor effect is by enhancing the function of tumor-specific CD4s and potentially CD8s as well. These CD4 cells produce interferon gamma enhanced by BCG that signals to interferon gamma receptor on the tumor cell itself. And data I did not show you, this is independent, does not require the MHC class two expression on the tumor cell. And so there's some, some other mechanism at work here. Um, what the ultimate mechanism by which BCG does this is, I have not shown you that. I've just shown you the end result on the T cells. We, uh, we hypothesize that, that it is an innate effect on mononuclear cells in the tumor microenvironment, similar to what I showed you in that uh, heterologous immunity paper, and that the effect of BCG here is to enhance uh, uh, antigen-independent functions of things like antigen-presenting cells, but at this point, that's just a hypothesis that we're actively exploring. So uh, I hope I've shown you that BCG induces tumor-specific immunity, it enhances the effector functions of tumor-specific CD4 T cells. Um, the long-term immune memory is predominantly CD4 dependent, and that interferon gamma directly signals to the tumor cell to maintain tumor suppression. So just for some broader perspective, uh, I think this provides an example of how studying BCG in the context of cancer sheds light onto the mechanisms by which this bacterium can immunize against heterologous antigens. Uh, the phenotype we see in the bladder model is, is ultimately a immunization against a uh, tumor antigen, but one could imagine that non-mycobacterial infections might operate similarly, um, such as the viral examples I gave earlier. We do believe that study of immune response to infections, cancer, and the interaction of the two has great power to unlock insights for both. And then uh, finally, we, we hope that these kinds of studies will ultimately lead to ways that we can enhance the activity of BCG for bladder cancer or predict its clinical response. Um, for example, by looking for, uh, um, for looking at assays that would predict uh, BCG's activity based on the data that I've showed you. And we're actively involved with our uro urology collaborators in trying to do uh, such translational studies. So I just, uh, especially in this time, uh, I'd like to thank uh, all the people in my lab who did this work. Uh, so Gil is right here. He's a physician scientist, infectious diseases specialist, presently fully engaged in the COVID response in the hospital. He did 
He leads the bladder cancer work in my lab, and he is a co-investigator on the P50 bladder cancer spore here at MSK. Anthony is a WOW graduate, stool, uh, graduate student who works on this project, and Anna is my uh, head technician who also is an expert at the MB49 model and, and uh, runs the lab. I'm very, very grateful to all of these people. Uh, it's been a tough time for everybody who runs a lab and everybody works in a lab as it has for the entire world, and I appreciate their professionalism. We're funded by a variety of entities, uh, which I've shown here, and I'd just like to thank uh, everybody for listening and really thank the institution for starting this series and also being uh, either visionary or tolerant for the idea that mycobacteriology could somehow be relevant to cancer biology. So I think we're gonna open it up for questions now, um, and I'm gonna go to this slide, which has the submission requirements on it. And I think Thomas is gonna come back on, there he is, um, to submit questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mike. That was a really inspiring uh, seminar. And there are a lot of questions actually. Uh, actually, uh, many of them are um, deal with these, this interface of, of COVID-19 and potential protection that BCG vaccination could confer to this disease. Uh, this was asked by several different um, uh, folks uh, asking about the uh, potentially uh, the role of BCG dampening the effect in, uh, for example, the developing countries um, where it's more routinely administered. Uh, any thoughts there uh, on mechanism or more broadly on the epidemiological uh, impact? Sure. Um, so that as as those questions may be referring to and may as may maybe others have seen, there were two preprints that came out or or one that's out and one maybe is about to come out uh, that tried to correlate the epidemiologic distribution or the distribution of BCG vaccination with the mortality from covid nineteen. Uh, and those papers that that, in all honesty, I'm probably not as much of an expert to judge the the methods there as i as I are and for other things, but the, the papers asserted that there was a correlation between BCG vaccination and lower mortality. Um, it's not perfect though, because obviously China has universal BCG vaccination. Um, and I, I'm not sure it would explain the, uh, the large age differential we see. Um, for example, I mean, the idea would be that BCG given to children, you know, pro provides protection in the early phase of life. And then maybe that's why kids are on, are less affected by COVID. I, I think the problem with that is that age differential has been seen in a wide variety of countries, including the United States now. So I think it's not where BCG is not given. So I think it's not a perfect, uh, um, perfect idea, but, um, you know, there is this supporting other data that BCG vaccination can provide heterologous protection against a wide variety of other infections. And so it's not a, I don't think it's an insane idea. And I think that the thing that, I mean, I think we're all searching for, because of the acuity of the crisis, we're all searching for off the shelf things that can be used immediately. And that that's totally legitimate and, and important. Um, BCG is one of those things. I mean, it, it is a very widely administered and very safe vaccine. So if one were to think about the downside of giving it, I mean, it, it's, it's extensively tested. So I, I think I can't speak to whether it will be effective or whether how optimistic I am, but I, I, don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's unreasonable to consider it given its availability and its, its widespread safety record. Thank you. Um, another string, another area where we got a lot of questions on was uh, BCG and bladder cancer. So this is a two part question for you. Why does it work best for, for bladder cancer? And then conversely, in populations where BCG is administered routinely, do we see less bladder cancer population level? So the answer to the second question is no. Um... That has not been noted. Um, and the first question was, oh, why doesn't it work for other cancers? Was that, was that what that was? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, it was tried in many cancers, actually, early on, after that Lloyd Old paper. It was, there are many 
uh, attempts to use it in melanoma and, um, you know, it was given intravenously to children as a treatment for leukemia, um, uh, it, lung cancer. It, it was really tried in widely in, in various malignancies. And, and I, I'm, this is editorializing here for sure. Uh, um, but I, I, my impression about, about, so, so because it's a live bacterial therapy, there is toxicity. So, I mean, I mean, it, it, you know, if you inject BCG intravenously, you're giving somebody a severe intravenous infection. And indeed we see that as a complication of bladder cancer therapy uh, rarely. Um, so if you're doing that intentionally for, uh, to treatment of cancer, the, the, the therapeutic to toxicity ratio is dramatically different. And the other thing I would point out is that it, it's quite clear that BCG needs to be in direct contact with the tumor cell to work in bladder cancer. So that's harder to achieve in a, in a solid tumor lesion that has to be injected, I think. And so in, the bladder is sort of anatomically suited for direct administration, both from a practicality point of view, but also from a contact with the tumor surface point of view. So I think it, and it also contains the infection so that it does not disseminate in most cases. So I think, I think it, it's ideally set up for, um, for, for BCD to be effective. It doesn't mean that BCD would not have a similar anti-tumor effect in other cancers if it could be delivered in a similar way but I don't think we necessarily know how to do that. I mean, one thing I'll say is that our, our prior work identified certain oncogenic mutations, such as RAS, for example, uh, um, that enhance the uptake of BCG into bladder cancer cells. So one, you know, one could think about uh, maybe a more targeted approach where one tried BCG in other tumors that had specific mutations, um, although that has not been done, it's just an idea. That makes, makes sense. Um, we have uh, quite a few uh, more questions here related to the mechanism uh, of action. Um, is it known if BCG will induce IL-12 and IL-18 and could these be uh, pro-inflammatory signals that play a role upstream of T-cell activation? Uh, I think the answer to that is yes. Um, many cytokines have been measured in the urine of BCG treated patients. I think, I don't, I can't remember IL-18, but IL-12 is definitely present. Uh, so I think, I think the upstream innate, specific innate mechanisms, uh, which that questioner is referring to remain to be interrogated. I think we have the systems to do it now and uh, we hope to do it, but I think those are all very good ideas, um, which we have not yet examined. Okay. And uh, uh, another question that just came in about uh, heat and heat inactivated BCG, would you expect that to work or is the attenuated still live pathogen required? Uh, so it's, it, so it is required to be alive. Um, so it, um, there was a product actually BCG cell wall skeleton that was a cell wall preparation of BCG that actually failed in clinical trials and, and heat killed BCG does not work. So what that is, I mean, what, what the, you know, whether there needs to be, for example, pathogen replication in the bladder cell as the initial phase of this, it's, we don't quite understand that, but it, it is, it does need to be viable to be effective. Okay. Um, Another question deals with combinations of checkpoint inhibition and BCG therapy in bladder cancer. Has that been explored? Um, I would defer to my urologic oncology colleagues for that, but uh, my understanding is that that is being tested now in clinical trials, um, that there are active, active investigations now uh, e exactly uh, on that point. Okay. Um, and then the, uh, the role of interferon gamma. So you showed that uh, yeah, the, the cancer cells require interferon gamma receptor expression to respond in the mouse model. Is, it, is there any clinical data showing that tumors that our patients, tumors that lose expression of gamma receptor escape? Is there any correlation there? I mean, not in BCG, but that's as you, as many know, it's that is a mechanism of escape for other immunotherapies. I mean, downregulation of interferon gamma signaling pathway in you know checkpoint has been, 
you know, found in, in many models, uh, both human and, and animal, uh, to be a mechanism of immune escape uh, for tumors. So I, th I think it, it falls into that uh, paradigm very, very neatly. Um, but there is no clinical data showing that uh, BCG uh, escapers, people who fail BCG, have lost interferon gamma receptor expression. We haven't, we haven't done that. It's a good idea. Okay. Uh, we have a very interesting question about uh, the evolution of the immune system or the immune response more broadly in, uh, in us humans and in mammals. Can you surmise, surmise to the advantage uh, with heterolog heterologous antigen response after an infection? Can you argue that this is an inefficient response to the infection at hand? Hmm. So meaning, is it maladaptive to? Well, I guess that's the question. That's the way I understand the question. Is it, is it maladaptive or is it actually beneficial to develop a um, uh, sort of cross immunity in this way? Uh, I mean, I, I, I can't say that I'm qualified to answer that question. I, I think, um, in all honesty, I mean, I, I think one could speculate that, um, I mean, I, I think this sort of falls into the realm of, uh, you know, it's often referred to as trained immunity is, is one of the monikers it's known as, um, but I think, you know, I think there has been an evolution in our thinking about the idea of immune memory. Um, and so, you know, the classical view of, of antigenic, antigen specific immune responses that they have memory and that innate immune cells don't have memory. But I think, I think it's a little more gray than that. There is a sort of immune tone that can be, uh, um, you know, enhanced by infection in, in cells that are not antigen specific. I mean, Joe Sun in our immunology program has, has been one of the leaders in doing that in NK cells. So I think... The, the, the line between um, innate and adaptive immunity in terms of memory has been blurred. And so I think it's plausible that there's, there's an immune tone that is um, enhanced by infection and which may cross protect against other infections. But I think it's not well understood. Uh, I think it's, it's, a very, it's obviously a very hot area right now, um, but that, that's the best answer I can give. Okay. Uh, we have one last question. This is a lot of questions, a really good discussion, uh, and, and we were able to address most of them. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, we did get many um, sort of circling around similar topics. The last question uh, is uh, to do with uh, metastatic bladder cancer. Does BCG work on metastasized bladder cancer? Does it need to be localized in the bladder? It needs to be localized in the bladder. So okay. it, it, it will not work for invasive, e even locally invasive. So not even metastatic, but but it, it has to have direct contact, and it only works. For, it is only indicated for superficial bladder cancer. So it's not not does not work if the lesion is invasive, presumably because it requires this direct contact with the tumor. Okay. Thank you, Mike, for a fantastic seminar and discussion. It was very enjoyable. Uh, thanks to everyone who attended, uh, and welcome back. Our next uh, seminar is already on Wednesday at 4.30 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time, and our speaker will be Charles Sawyers from our Human Oncogenesis uh, and, and Pathogenesis Program. With that, uh, I want to thank everyone and uh, wish everyone all the best. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you.